we got to act serious. That's right. Right. All right. Yeah. Welcome to EdTech. There yeah. you go, Jeff. <laughs> Thanks. We haven't had a guest do that since Jeff left. <laughs> yeah, I got to not look at the, the video when I'm doing this. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to EdTech Weekly, episode 183. Today is February 13th, 2011, and EdTech Weekly is a discussion of educational technology, news, and resources. And we broadcast each Sunday night in North America at edtechtalk.com slash live, where you can join us in the Ustream or in the text chat. And this is John Schinker in Stowe, Ohio. This is Dave Corby in Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island. This is Jennifer Madrill in Chicago, Illinois, with snow behind me. And this is Jeff Lebo in Pusan, Korea, back from my 23-week hiatus. Delighted to be with the EdTech Weekly crew once again and playing with Skype Multicam. Uh, so for those of you on the Ustream, you can see all four of us in live exciting video. I'll OMG! Do show that it's live. <laughs> it's not a picture. It's live. Not only do we get Jeff back, but we get to look at him. Look! Look! <laughs> His hair is still long. He's still a well. Hippie. I don't want to get, get a too much. Ponytail up, Yeah, let's it, see. It, my, I, I asked my wife to trim it just a little bit, and she hacked <laughs> off like a year and a half of growth. Oh. So I have like this little little nub of what used to be the full hippiness. <laughs> and so she's event. pretty happy about the long hair then. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> She's like, oh, yeah, I guess I cut off a lot. <laughs> anyway, so things Have are so different. I don't know how to do this EdTech Weekly thing anymore. What's the topic? What's the topic? Let's, well, here. We're going to start I, off. We've all got our, our, our things we're going to talk about this week. I'm going to start us out with the link that I long prepared and posted uh, oh, three, four minutes before the show started. This is um, this is a neat little piece of software, let me tell you. For the last four or five weeks, I've been um, co-facilitating, and take the word super lightly, a course in learning analytics. And we've been playing with all these crazy tools to mess around with big data, grab this stuff and twist it around and make pretty graph and try to prove something. Um, think social network analysis, all these kinds of fantasy words that you hear at the sort of outside reaches of the internetosphere around, around learning and education. And this one here, Holy, holy. It really gives you that sense of how um, just what you can do now, not knowing anything about computers with a little bit of persistence. This software is called Needlebase. And what I'm showing you right there is a list of all of the accommodations for PEI scraped off the PEI tourism website. What it allows you to do is go to a website and it logs all the clicks that you would make and then will assign them to a table. So let's say that you had, oh, I don't know, a password to a website that you just signed up to. You could log into that website, have it log into that website for you, and then click all the next <laughs> buttons all the way through the website and grab all the data from every page and slot it into a field in a table. And then take that table and do whatever you want with it. Are you following? I see some confused look in the this video chat thing is really useful because if you guys are confused. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm with you. I don't know. I'm, I can't imagine how it happens, but I, I, I understand there's magic happening. It has in the background, but you don't need to understand any of it to do what I did right here. So what you see here are a list of 283 accommodations across PEI and you see description, mailing address, email. These were all taken off different pages. This system, it has a little WYSIWYG interface that shows you what you might do when you get to the page and you click on the next button and it goes, oh, is that a next button? And you go, yeah, yeah, that's where the next button is. And then you highlight stuff and you go, this is the title field and tell it that. And then it sort of remembers it and then goes through all the pages and scrapes all the data out. I have a question the, about it. Is yeah. it a program that you download to your computer? Is it a website that you it's log into? It's a website called needlebase.com. This and is anyone can website. use it to, Anybody can to just harvest data from any other from website. Any other website. So and it's got to be a website, print. right? It can't be like a document or... That's right. Oh, no. This, seem like, this a... seems like a spammer's dream. It's incredible. You can <laughs> yeah. upload a CSV file and map it up against this stuff, and it will guess. Like you say, okay, take the names from the CSV file I have and match it up against the names that I found on these 14 websites and try to find the places where they're the same. And it'll actually meld them together. You can do anything with this software. 
it's just crazy. What it really gives you a sense of is how much power is out there. I mean, I don't know what I'm doing, and I can take this software and scrape all this content off a website. Now, if you have a login, it'll remember your login, it'll go in, and it'll scrape content from wherever you like. So when we talk about protected environments, all the rest of the stuff where we talk about teaching kids, or you talk any kind of environment where anybody can ever get a login, this is how easy it is to go in and just take all the content out. It's amazing. So in your um, sessions, what were folks thinking this could be useful for, like from an ed educational oh, research? Good question, Jen. Um, so yeah. the, where big, I, I don't know that this particular software, I'm going to speak more broadly because it's easier because I only barely understand what I'm talking about. Um, there are a couple of really interesting examples. For instance, at Purdue, what they're doing is they're going through the LMS and counting the kinds of connections that people are making, the amount that they post, the content in the post, the response they get from other people, how often people respond, that kind of stuff, and give them a, a green, yellow, red rating on how they're doing. So students sign up to be part of what they call the Signals Project, and then they get kind of feedback about how well they're doing, how hard they're trying, say. How hard they're trying is a good one. So you could be trying harder in this course compared to your peers. And it just gives people a vague sense of how deep they're in. And what that does in the back end is it pulls all the content out of all the discussion forums, remixes it all up together, and then gives you a yay, nay on it. Wouldn't it be black and gold? You're hilarious, <laughs> Um So in that sense, it allows you to, to harvest all this data and make really simple responses out of it. Because that's the thing about big data. There's so much of it that simply looking at it casually is not going to do something for you. So it allows you to pull in massive amounts and then make really simple claims or, or references from it. Now, there are a whole host of problems with that, obviously, but uh, it's happening now anyway. The question is, is what are we going to do with it? So can you, um, and I, mean, I know you haven't played with it a lot, but from a qualitative standpoint, can you set parameters for things? Say you, there were certain uh, words or phrases that you were hoping would come out of discussions. Yeah. I'm saying, for example, could you then pull that back and have it pull back all the discussions re related to those words? Yeah, you could. Something like that. Um, this software couldn't do that, but there's software out there that could. And right now, there's sort of an arms race for that particular kind of software going on where people are desperately trying to get to the point where they can find a system that they can claim automates that process. So there's a piece of software used at uh, some university in the East Coast, I forget the name of it, where uh, we did a we did those guys in week one, so that's like four weeks ago. Of course, I forget all the names. Um, and what they're doing is they have an entire set of softwares where students log into it, and then it remembers every keystroke that happens in there. And they do stuff like, test how many like check for how many times they hit the help button how long they're there the kinds of questions they ask keywords that are asked to the help thing and then sort of grabbing that kind of stuff so watching for it in that way so there's a lot of different ways that people are going about it and again every time you open your mouth about it you go well what about this all those things are problems but the simple fact is that right now there's a lot of money I mean, the gates foundation has put down 400 million dollars sort of around this field where they're looking to promote sort of ways of doing broad-based analysis on this kind of data to find out how people are learning. I think it's scary. I mean, my main interest in it is around the MOOC stuff because I've been asked by people who said, hey, we'd like to do one. We'd like to, you know, maybe we can fund it. How do we get a sense of whether or not this has been successful? And I go, I don't know. We have no idea if they're successful because uh, we don't. But if you had an ability to go out and harvest data and make some kind of conclusion from it it might be useful but there are people looking for a lot more definitive things from it i think could you envision using needlepoint to go grab data across a mooc you know from everyone's blogs and things like that and bring yeah. it in from multiple sites yeah you could i mean uh stephen downs has software that does that right now it's called grasshopper and what grasshopper will do is um for people who are in the in the course you can actually go in and subscribe your blog to it but it also harvest all the tweets and all the other references, wraps them all together, and they get sent out in the newsletter every day. That is a sort of a, it gathers together all the posts. So that as a as a casual watcher, you could not use a single search engine and still get most of the posts that make any reference to the course simply by looking through the stuff that comes out in the daily mail out. 
Of course, so Drupal could do like, that too. Well, but it can only do it for a single site. So this is kind of like Google Analytics across the internet, where uh, you, you set up analytics on your site, you can see where people came into your site, where they clicked, how much time they spent on each page, um, you know, which links they looked at, which articles, what what they downloaded, where they went. Um, and so this kind of, of software, this analytic sort of software will allow you to look at that across sites. Um, and you take I, all also, three things. Yep. Go ahead, John. Sorry. I'm also thinking in, in terms of learning management systems, because I can go into my Moodle server and I can see how much time the kids spent on each page, when they logged in, when they logged out, how much time they spent, where they went, what they did uh, in, a, in a very impressive amount of detail. And so if we take that idea and apply it to something like a MOOC, where they're all over the internet, that's right. Then I'm sorry. this sort of software allows us to do similar things. When you say this sort of software, is this referring to needle, needle base or? Uh, something I mean, else? I think it's it's just the class of software that Dave's describing in general. I don't know that it's specific to this. Have we had any examples from there. that class of software? I just put one in the chat room. Snap is a really uh, well one. Grasshopper yeah. is definitely that. Stephen Downs' software. Snap actually works inside of an LMS. It's designed to go ahead and simply go through something like Moodle and find the connections in a discussion forum and reproduce them in a really sort of simple Java interface. Uh, something like Gephi is the next level up of complexity. It'll allow you to grab random piles of data from different places and remix them in crazy ways and make pretty graphs. I don't entirely understand how it works, but really, I mean, we've had a piece of software around for a long time that does this. It's Yahoo Pipes. Um, does the same kind right. of thing, right? It will go out and grab different bits of data. You can feed stuff through it. You know, you look at something like the Twitter API, there's so many things you can do with Twitter to sort of wrench the data and twist it sideways. You know, John, you take that, you compare it with something like John downloading Wikipedia um, <laughs> to go off to, you know, so there's so much yeah. massive amounts of data out there that you can grab and start to recombine that it gets... Um, it gets really complicated, one. And two, they're so showy. Like they're just, they're so impressive looking that I, I have very grave concerns about um, what's going to happen whenever we hit the, like especially in higher ed, when we look at the cost cutting that's coming down the pike and you look at first year courses and you go, Pfft. if we can just throw this at what people are doing in a first year course, why do we need people in there? Um, and real and the software, like five years from now, it'll look that good, easy. It's almost there now. And of course, we have to play devil's advocate. <clears throat> Someone has to play oh. on, on every round. <laughs> I hope but so. But in in my uh, and I think you've touched on some of this already. That um, it is what it is. I mean, it's going to pull back what's there. And so, in my dissertation, I looked at five classes and I pulled bun back a bunch of activity data from um, from Blackboard. And just very, I mean, nothing like this. Just uh, act, not, times you accessed it, a number of discussion posts, things like that. And you could tell right away, users do not use the LMS exactly the same way. You could tell a lot of students went in the first day, downloaded a whole bunch of stuff, and only went back when they were required to. <laughs> so at first I thought, oh, I'll be able to try to track some access numbers and see uh, is there any relationship between those that spent a lot of time on the LMS and some of their uh, responses on the, the survey or whatever it might be. And I could tell, you could just tell right away, users used it completely differently. Um, and so this kind of, kind of makes an assumption if you're using it, like I said, to, to analyze access or how people utilize a piece of software or website or whatever it might be, it's, not, it's usually not the same, you know? And how do you say one is better or different? Because they're different, is one better, is one worse? That type of thing, right? Which is fine as long as you're doing those kinds of qualitative judgments. But, I mean, so much of our education system is falling to the quantitative. I say falling because right. I'm biased. Um, but no, and no, you're, you're saying it much more eloquently than I am is that everything that I've seen so far is quantitative. You know, it's like here's yeah. a bunch of numbers and let's make some interpretation from them. And it's like, well, you kind of have to drill down a little no. bit on people. Well, fair, fair enough. But there is actually some really nice qualitative stuff that's out there. If you look at the work that's being done, I, I use his name all the time. But by um, Tony, uh, what's his face in the uh, Psychomedia? Hurst uh, like Tony Hurst. He's got some really nice stuff that he's putting together that allow you to see the way that networks kind of combine. I mean, you could try to call that quantitative if you like, but it's more sort of top level snapshot stuff where you're starting to see 
the network forming. The truth is, is those links are there. It's the same thing as um, Rick Schwier is talking about how Snap is a nice visualization tool, especially when you use it to filter for numbers or connections. Those connections are implicit in the internet. You know, actually, they're explicit in the internet. They are what the internet is. So going out onto the internet and counting the connections and showing where they are isn't making a value judgment. Um, the problem is where people forget that those connections are the way that they are because that's the way the internet is built, or not because that's the way that people are, right? And I, that's a, I don't think I made that distinction well, but to me, that's, that's the critical piece, is that this stuff is all really easy to measure on the net because there are mathematical realities about the way that the net is built that allow you to count things. But those are artificial. They're not artificial by learning. They're artificial by the net. You know what I'm saying? And then it, yeah. And then it just, to get back to what I was saying, it's, then it just becomes the interpretation, you know, just so yeah. that there's a good understanding of what you pulled back. <laughs> so you're able to then, you know, make a, a good interpretation of it. All right. Anything else? No, um, I just I wanted to I... toss in the money aspect of this with needle base in particular. It's free. Uh, there's a free version, a professional, and a premium. The free version lets you grab 100,000 nodes and 5,000 pages a uh, month. And for double that, uh, you can pay $400 a month. So you go from free to 400 a month. The big difference seems to be that with the free version, all data is public. For the pay version, data is private and secure. So that seems to be what you pay the money for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very interesting. All right. So anyway, Learning Analytics Conference starts the 27th of February. I'm going to be there. I'm looking forward to it. And uh, yeah, it's exciting. That's really exciting. How many people Scary, are talking? Do you but, have any idea? Um, last I heard, they were thinking it was going to get to 100. That's, that's a nice size. Well, first time conference. Nobody knows what it is. It's not really a field yet. And... Um, yeah. So anything I, online, live, interactive? I think it will be. Uh, it looks that way. They said they're gonna, it's George Siemens is running the conference. So probably, I mean, any chance George gets to look at himself, he'll put it online. So I figure. <laughs> just... <laughs> um, All righty. Well, totally switching mm. gears. I have no segue whatsoever. Um, I'm just going to put the link to our wiki here because I've got a whole slew of links. Uh, and I didn't expect anyone to have read all of these because most of them are reports. But here's what the gist of what my turn is about. Um, there have been a series of publications and articles talking about how students across America, high school students, are ill-prepared to go on to the next level, whether it be college, whether it be um, some vocational training, whatever it may be. Um, all kinds of numbers thrown out about uh, as far as um, graduation rates and the relationship between graduation rates and then some sta other standardized test me measures. And there's some um, kind of uh, interesting articles coming out of New York saying that, yes, they're graduating more students, but actually they're less prepared for the next step than they were before. So you can... <laughs> whatever you want to make from that. So um, what I think is then an interesting then people are saying, okay, so we're, we've got all this reliance on standardized tests and we're showing in all sorts of measures, all sorts of different ways mm -hmm. that students aren't prepared for the next level. So uh, the second link, or third bullet point on, my, on the wiki there, I think maybe I can dump this in, it's a PDF, is a study from Harvard suggesting, okay, if we aren't hitting uh, these college ready measures, then maybe we should, instead of preparing everyone for college, we should have people prepared for multiple pathways. And so of course then that strikes up a whole debate saying, well then we're um, dampening expectations, we're lowering the bar for some students, we're pegging them into careers when they're 18 years old or even younger, uh, and then that raises a whole slew of issues. So just kind of wanted to toss it out to the group if this is something you thought about yet or if what there, you think about is there if there's a disconnect between what K-12 is doing and what higher education is doing, is that because one of them has adapted and the other hasn't? I mean, is is it that the the colleges have changed what they expect of our kids and the K-12 system hasn't? Or Not so much. Is it um, that it, it, oh, sorry, go ahead. Or, or has the, the K-12 world changed in what they're doing? You know, are they 
are they focused too much on one thing as opposed to another and and that's so that that they are not meeting the k or the higher education needs or is it i don't understand well, where the disconnect is um, what so has if changed you read, if you read the achieve.org that does a pretty good job of giving a lay of the land, something I'm totally not familiar with, and I'm not a K-12 expert by any stretch. Hmm. Uh, I just read enough to be very dangerous. But uh, this basically gives you the lay of the land, what the requirements are across all the states in the United States. And they're different, and each state has different, uh, but they're trying to move toward uh, common standards. Some, I think we're halfway there. Um, and so everything at this point is based on uh, a pretty common goal for what would be required to move students on to the next level. So reading, um, math skills, just whatever you, whatever they would, whatever has been come up as standards to prepare people. And it doesn't appear there's, I think your point is, is there a gap between those expectations and then what colleges are, are expecting? Is that what you're saying? Because that's right. not that does not appear to be the pro the the problem. Problem appears to be that um, at one point maybe we were making making these and now we're not. It seems to be a common argument. Um, mm -hmm. And again, kids this these is not, days. Kids. Well, these and days. I I just wonder if you know with NCLB and I, I'm uh, admittedly in, on a U.S. centric perspective here, but you know with the focus on on standards and on meeting those standards and assessing those standards, um, those are all very information based. They're all really low on the on the Bloom's hierarchy. And so, you know, the, my question there is, are the kids going into college not being able to do more with analysis and synthesis? Exactly. And That's pretty much there's the higher level minutes. things because they're spending all of their time trying to get all the questions answered correctly because that's what the schools are graded on. And it could be. And, and then if you that, and that's actually in the, the fourth bullet point I have. Um, there's kind of the other side of this saying, let, you know, let's stop talking about the standard. Let's talk about what's actually being taught and um, and what, what we're spending our time on. Um, yeah. like, so, sorry, Dave, I stepped on you. Go ahead. Oh, no, that's okay. I was trying to cut in. Um, I have a dean at my university who makes the same response every time this topic comes up, and that's that 40 years ago, 50 years ago, we were sending 6% of our population to university, and now it's 44 Um and I think while there's an implicit elitist argument there that I'm not comfortable with, um, there are a lot of different angles to this discussion. And I think that if you look back, <clears throat> I was reading a piece from um, the 19th century, um, I think it was 1880-ish, where there was a prof whining about how the kids these days were coming into university unprepared. Um, and I think that what you end up with there is that that's endemic in the kind of person who ends up working at a university. They have this sense where they constantly re forget the fact that first year students have never really been prepared for university because university is the place where they get prepared. Um, I think that there is some truth to the idea that if 6% of the people are going to universities and most of those people are coming out of private schools, that those private schools were designed for different kinds of success than the public schools, well, at least in the North American version of public-private, uh, and obviously it's the other way around in the UK, but um, the ones that you pay for are designed differently, and they see success inside of them. And that's not something that happened five years ago. That's true 100 years ago. You know, when you've got a school system designed to get people to work on time, or you've got a school system designed for them to tell people to get to work on time. And we've never come to terms with that distinction. Uh, with the change overall that now we want everyone to lead. Um, and to me, that is the the big nasty discussion that we got ahead of us in education is, do we really want to have a school? Do we honestly, can we honestly say that we all want a school system where all the kids are trained to be leaders? And how many well, people will really mean that? You should. Well, uh, the problem should is that you have to... Oh, sorry, Sorry, John, the ahead. problem is if you don't train them all to be leaders, then you have to decide who you're going to train to be leaders, which means that you're saying this group of kids can't be. So you're closing doors for them, which we really you're, don't like doing. You're not wrong. I, I, I'm not saying I want to close their doors either, but this is the system that we inherited. The system right. we inherited had those clearly divided lines. And now we don't want those lines to be there, but we're not addressing 
the fact that it's a change, you know, that yeah. now we're and, saying everybody gets to lead. And you know what, uh, Dave, you, you get the, I really um, would encourage you to read the Harvard um, study because it really, it, it's, I mean, it's coming from Harvard's. So these aren't like me writing it. <laughs> I mean, hopefully they've spent some time in, and actually. So it's uh, coming from it's, Harvard, not coming from Wisconsin. Is that yeah, what you're saying? No, not <laughs> just me and my. I'm not sitting on my blog going. I think this is a good plan. Uh, so hopefully they spend some time thinking about these recommendations. But I mean, they're really throwing the skunk on the table here, saying not everyone's cut out for college, and not everybody should be cut out for college. And that's kind of you know that really rubs a lot of people, and really including me when I first read it the wrong way, saying, well, who's going to be the person then that decides and points to student A, B, and C and says we're going to track you over here because we don't think you're you're cut out for it which then as i said there's I, I included some blog posts from those that are saying that this is just not fair i mean how do you possibly start tracking students under a quote it sounds very cheery and good on multiple pathways that we're going to give yeah. people options yeah. but the, the devil in the detail is that means you're, we're not going to prep you for college how monolithic are they seeing college you know this thing is entitled pathways to prosperity meeting the challenges of preparing the young Americans for the 21st century. How much is college this fixed idea? How much is it whatever comes after high school? Well, um, they do talk about that. At the beginning, they, they reference, um, I think Obama had a speech in 2009 right out of the box saying he wants everybody to take an, one year after high school. That should be at least a, a minimum. And so that could be vocational school. It could be, you know, whatever, cooking school, you know, whatever. You know, he, he didn't... In, including you know regular college and rolling in regular yeah. college. Yeah, part. I mean, part of that is you come out of high school not ready to do anything, so you have to have some sort of training somewhere, whether that's going to higher education or going to a vocational tech prep, community college, whatever it is. Um, you know, very there are very few jobs that a student with a high school diploma is really qualified to do. Yeah, so that kind of starts out, you know, where they're coming from, and then they. They kind of walk you through different quote pathways and um, and why it's actually needed for the economy that we aren't preparing our electricians well or not preparing our you know construction managers well and um, kind of making a business case for it as well you know from the an economic standpoint. So well, I mean, I think, I they're kind of they're making the 19th century argument all over again that we need to have people trained for the factories and people trained to run the factories and. Or at least it sounds like it, and I definitely will read it because I the I'm about to write a piece for the Purpose Ed. Have you seen the stuff that uh, Doug Belshaw is doing no, in the UK? Uh -uh. He's getting people to do 500 word blog posts every day. There's a series of people I've already signed up and just said I want to do one on what is the purpose of education. And I've been winding myself up. It's funny that this came up all week to write this post about how um, we want the change to be there, but we don't want to face that really difficult question. That is, we can't have an education system that's designed for everyone to lead because that isn't the way our society works where now, does the leading thing come like i heard being prepared to get a job or meet their academic needs is that equivalent to teaching them leadership well making the i mean i think dave you're saying if you go if you're going on to get your bachelor's your master's whatever you're saying that me is equivalent with leading is that what you mean no, what I'm saying is that you saying? when you look at the rhetoric around um, the way that people talk about their schools and what they're trying to do with them, they, the, the stuff that I, that I hear people talk about is we need to train for creativity. We need to, and, and I think, I personally think those are really good things. I just don't know how much we're considering how much trouble we have um, with what we actually think the education system is for. Is it about building creative people for the future? Is it about creating a normative society where we all understand to use the same words the same way? Um, and that's where I always get caught in this discussion. And maybe I'm sort of veering us off the side here and I don't mean to, uh, or maybe I do, but I shouldn't. <laughs> anyway, I feel bad if I'm doing that. Maybe I do mean it. Um, <laughs> maybe you don't. <laughs> maybe I don't. I don't know. Um, anyway. There, um, there. I, what, was your, what was your question again, Jeff? Well, I, Dave kept saying, you know, do we want to prepare everyone to be a leader? And that oh, wasn't okay. what I thought how this was, was framed. And I, I'd say 
it, if rather than preparing them to be leaders, I think we need to prepare them to be collaborators and to work in this, you know, mookie working together kind of world. But it's not, though. It's not oh. a mookie working together kind of world. Most people do what they're told. I mean, that's the way our job systems are structured. Well, most people don't maybe get to do last century. Kind of world. But this is what I mean. Like the change you're this. OK, you said it. What you did a way better job of structuring the argument than I did. I think that's great. That's not the world they're going to hit when they leave school. Well, Bonnie's getting frustrated. She's been listening to me whining about this for days. <laughs> oh, we'd love to hear from bring Bonnie. Her in. Yeah, bring Bonnie in. Bring Bonnie in. Hand that headset smart. over. Sorry, I can't do it. Hi, Hi Bonnie. Hi. Hi Bonnie. <laughs> that's too funny. Um, but Jeff, the the Harvard article really isn't talking necessarily about specific skill sets it's also talking about um, something that we, I hadn't mentioned that I didn't want to make sure I got in is also um, it, there's things that maybe students are there are areas they may be interested in and we aren't allowing them to explore that because as John has said and as Davis said there's certain things we're trying to teach them and so maybe um, they'd love to spend more time in the you know something lab and then that's just not part of the the deal so their rosy way of p painting this is saying let's work very closely with the students and see where they are pat where their passions are and let's push them that direction rather than saying everybody should have the same path so it's not necessarily at a like a leadership i didn't get that out of it anyway that everybody has to be a leader okay. it was just so more Dave that was everybody just should that up. uh well at least the, Har <laughs> the harvard article was more just like everybody should learn the same thing and that will prepare everybody for every conceivable job that's out there. And, and I'll just mention that, true. you know, a lot of these same issues come up in Korea from a slightly different perspective, the dissatisfaction with how... Actually, there's a very cool, there's a very cool end note about Korea, by the way. What does it say? Article, it says saying Jeff that, is awesome. Um, saying they've pushed everybody to college <laughs> and now everybody's college educated without a job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so they, they, that's they, true. It, it, very so, true. But anyway, go ahead. But Sorry, they have Jeff. good bandwidth, so... That's true within the uh, within the peninsula. Um, you know, there's dissatisfaction with how high schools are preparing students, and it's because the system here is so much more test based. It's all about one test that give gets given once a year, and preparing for that test. And they're coming out not prepared for college, not prepared for vocations particularly. Um, and traditionally, depending on that result of the what are you doing, Dave? Uh, of that exam, <laughs> their major gets determined and their career gets determined based on how they do on a test that they take senior year in high school. Um, and so they're grappling with that as well. The one thing I'll say about the Korean system, in ways they can change much faster. Uh, when Korea decides to do something, it can change nationwide much more quickly. There's not as much discussion. There's a new president, There's the new no president discussion. says this, and that's the way it goes. I still remember the time they asked people to send in their gold, and they got like $2 billion in people's jewelry gold <laughs> sent in in like a week. It's crazy. We are one. Uh, Uri Hanguk. Yeah. Uri. Yeah. Uri. So anyway, I think uh, we'll be hearing more about these multiple pathways in our U.S. future. So sorry for the totally U.S.-centric <laughs> links, but... That's what's going on. Okay, off right. to Jeff. There's a John. Um, Jeff. Off to John. Jeff. I have to is say this, this new format is very strange. I can't squeak my chair at all. I have to give everyone as much time as they want to. There is on. no such thing as fast-paced no anymore. There is no speaking. You just keep going. So it's me. Yep. No, it's Jeff. It's Jeff oh, no, taking it's Jeff. taking the role of guest host. It's your turn, Jeff. Oh, right. That's right. No, it's John. It's Jeff is definitely last. He's right. He's guest. Yeah. I don't You're know the guest. anymore. You're the guest. It Which gives matter. me 10 more minutes to come up with a link. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Now, this is just going to take about 20 seconds just so Jeff is prepared. Um, new, the new Horizon report's out. And uh, Horizon report is an annual report that um, is... Uh, a collaboration between Educause and the New Media Consortium, and every year they look at um, what they think the trends are, what's coming in in educational technology, um, in three different time frames. They look at what's coming within the next year, and then the two to three year uh, 
uh, window and then what's going to happen in four to five years. And it, it's just it's interesting to look at this, especially because they've been doing it for eight years now. So we have the opportunity to to go back and look at some of those old ones and see what kinds of recurring themes there are and um, you know, look back and say, okay, five years ago they were they predicted these things were going to happen. Now that we're five years down the road, we can kind of take a look at that. Um, so for this year's report, um, they are uh, predicting ebooks and and mobile devices coming within the next year. And typically for the for the one year stuff, it's pretty um, standard kinds of technologies that that they describe they're they're things that we see happening in schools um, and this is this is mostly focused on on higher education so uh, we see a proliferation of ebooks we see people using mobile devices both uh, smartphones and tablet devices that they they can use to have access to uh, the internet anywhere um, in the two to three year time frame, uh, there are things like augmented reality and game-based learning. Uh, it's interesting because uh, augmented reality is this idea that that we can put an overlay of data or information on top of our reality. Um, uh, the example that I have is is uh, an application on my phone um, where I can I can hold the phone up and point it in different directions, and it'll show me, you know, where restaurants are in those those directions and how far away they are or where a YouTube video was recorded or information from Wikipedia about something that is that is in one of those locations so by pointing it in different uh, different directions I can get information about the world around me wherever I am um, and so there they uh, had first predicted that this would happen four to five years down the road and that was in 2006 and now they're saying it's another two to three years out um, also an emphasis this year on game-based learning, uh, both game-based from the perspective of uh, 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 single-player uh, um, skill-based games where students are learning basic skills using um, game-based software, but but more important than that, the, uh, the concept of multiplayer. What? Can I cut in on that one? No. Click the last click click okay. the last link I just put in. <laughs> click the last link about the gaming thing. Click the one There's with the downs.ca. Yeah, yeah. The one that downs.ca with the thing about gaming in it. Before you oh, get to your right. thing. Go ahead. That's fair. Go ahead. Okay. This is the report from the Horizon report over the last eight, seven, eight years, what they've <laughs> said about educational gaming. Two thousand four, <laughs> two to three year window. Two thousand five, two to three year window. Two thousand six, two to three year window. Two thousand seven, four to five year window. 2008, it's not on the list, not on the list in 2009, extinct in 2010, 2011, two to three year window. <laughs> now, trend doing is really difficult business. There's no doubt about it. But I just, this, uh, the link right before this is to the entire discussion in uh, on Downs' website where th there is some truth in saying that he's being unfair in his criticism of it. Um, and there's, there's no doubt about it. He is being unfair because the Horizon Report doesn't claim to be a Horizon watching report i think it's almost misnamed in that sense because it's more about yeah. what's happening and what the buzz is to let people know what conversations are happening in the popular discourse so that you can not be in the discourse and still find out which is to me what the horizon report's about it's not been very predictive <laughs> but i don't think that's yeah. what it's intended to do but i think that's a really it, it nice section of yeah it's not Sorry. and the link that i just dropped in the chat room actually goes through all of the rec all of the predictions for the horizon report um for all eight years and it it lists each uh, each technology along the left side and then there's a column for each year and it says when the year in which they predict that this is going to happen uh, so you can see those kinds of things like augmented reality was first predicted in 2006 and game-based learning was first predicted in 2007 um, and and when you get into the four to five year time frame, it's really a crapshoot on on what is is really going to happen. What what they're looking at is what are the current trends and where could this possibly lead? And you know, like I like I mentioned earlier, the the stuff within one year, I think we're we're pretty certain that most of that stuff is happening already. Um, and the stuff once you get to four to five years out, it's really. Um, a lot of guesswork involved in in what we're going to see happen that far down the pike and as you just noted 
a lot of those things get pushed, you know, where they say, okay, this is going to happen in five years. And then two years later, they say, this is going to happen in five years. And then two years later, they say, yeah, you know, we're not there yet, but this is really going to happen. Um, so I think what, what really is the most interesting part of this, at least for me, is to look at the two, two to three year time frame and see what kinds of things they're predicting. And, and many of those have, um, in the past, the things that they've described are things that, that we've actually seen. And Dave, in the cool. text chat, you mentioned that policy is affected by it. Do you really believe that? Oh, for sure it is. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the way it works out is that this one affects the way that people spend money, people like the Gates Foundation, people like Hewlett. And then governments and school districts and stuff move themselves to be able to get the funding. So you end up with this sort of veering off to the side here that that I mean, two billion dollars just got dropped on the uh, on not really on OER. I mean, we've had that clarified since it got came out from the mm -hmm. from the American government. But that wasn't that was done based on this kind of thing. Right. It's these kinds of reports that are being read by the American government that makes them think that they can put, let's say, seven hundred and fifty million dollars into the idea of open educational resources for um, for uh, Be because the colleges. Horizon report says that we're going to have ebooks within 12 months. Exactly. Exactly. How significant then, is this particular report? Is the Horizon the one that Bill Gates reads? You know, I was going to ask you that. Was this originally I, I an Educause report? Bill Gates reads them. I mean, because this I, is I don't now think from. He reads his stuff himself. NMC. Um, but I. But um, it's now New Media, New Media Consortium and Educause. I didn't remember they were originally part of it. Were they? Don't remember. Uh, they have been for a while. I don't know that originally they, I think originally it was just Educause. And uh, that has a very broad. four years ago, New Media Consortium was became part of that. I'll tell you what. That's, I can, that's I can tell you for team. sure that in my experience, I can hand these reports across the table and people look at them and go, oh, okay. Seriously. Current report is another one that came out in 2006, the open source one. Man, people got more mileage out of that report because you could slide that thing across the table and people look at it and go, oh, open source is cheaper. There's a big report that says it is by somebody who's recognizable. It's old. Seriously. <laughs> yep. And um, John, Don't you need to saying, go past um, the executive summary. I was, yep. I was going to say what, what I find um, as interesting as what they list, which we could argue is it even interesting because if you spend any time in this <laughs> following Twitter or in this field, you're going to pick up on these uh, technologies, but it's actually the links that they have afterwards and some of the other studies that were done or what other folks are using these technologies for um, in, in the real world. So I think those are kind of neat just mm -hmm. as an educator, just to see how people are actually using these things. And John, I put your link in there to your blog, which everyone should read, by the way. It's very good. And um, I think you have a good kind of counterpoint. Say? Um, well, you've got, I think, uh, your practical tablets uh, post about talking about which device, which mobile devices will be um, most effective in schools. And you raised some good points about um, different, ba is it going to be an iPad or is it going to be Android based? And then some of the other practical issues, like they don't usually have keyboards that are conducive to actually producing content, <laughs> and, typing. And, and maybe, it, and like maybe it's not going to be a tablet device at all. You know, it, this could be one of those things that it lasts for a year or so it's a little fad that we're looking at and then it goes away i mean netbooks were good we loved netbooks when they first came out and we had to convince the vendors to sell them to schools because they didn't see it as an educational product they saw it as a consumer product and we got some in and now that we're three years down the road we're seeing some of the limitations of them and so just kind of second guessing where we should be using them and making sure that we're not trying to apply them where they don't belong and I think one of the important points is that perhaps is understa understated in that blog post is that uh, tablets do not make very good content creation devices. They're great for yeah. consuming media, but in terms of editing video or doing digital storytelling on them, I don't see it notice yet. My, notice my ugly face. Yes, I see your ugly face. Um, <laughs> it, tell the difference. That usually means you disagree. No, it means you're wrong. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for clarifying that. Oh, I miss Sorry. you guys. <laughs> you listen, the only reason I made the ugly face is we have like eight minutes before the end of the show, and I can't let Jeff get away without doing a doing a link. 
There's no way. Oh, that so was got, a chair squeak. So that was, that that was, was like an ugly face chair squeak. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. All right, we will familiar. debate content creation on tablet devices another time, but now it's time for the founder of World Bridges and Ed Tech Talk employee number one to enlighten <laughs> us with his brilliance. Uh, well, There's I thought that was Dave. an excellent point about content creation on a tablet. I hadn't really thought about that, John. Uh, and if <laughs> what a, great a, segue. A, a link is demanded, a link shall be delivered. Uh, I found one to match. Last night, or... 12 hours ago was the closing webcast of the Electronic Village Online, uh, which for those who don't know, is this great yearly six week online free workshop collaboration thingy um, by a bunch of English language teaching cyber hippies. And during the conversation, uh, there's there were 10 different sessions and a lot of the discussion was around what platform is best to use for these kinds of workshops? And some used Moodles and some used Yahoo Groups. Yahoo Group is kind of the standard there. And some used blogs they've and used different those platforms. Forever. What's that? <laughs> they kind of that Yahoo Group, forever. they've been using that forever. <laughs> it's so 1998, yet <laughs> that wound up being the preferred method a lot because they were saying the Moodle is too slow. It was having trouble reaching people as instantaneously. So my question to you, for all these kind of open content, Mookie kind of let's learn together, what are your platform preferences? And since a link is demanded, fortunately, good old Richard Byrne of uh, Free Free Teach for Teachers, Free Tech for Teachers, uh, tossed in a seven free platforms for teaching online courses. Uh, and it's a fairly standard list. Some I haven't heard, Moodle, Claroline, and Udemy and our campus. What is, if you're going to do some kind of open workshop, uh, and I know Dave's answer is going to be use the internet, <laughs> use a tag or something. Um, okay, you can make that argument, but what is your <laughs> preference? <laughs> well, go ahead, Dave, make your argument. It completely depends on who who's coming in. Um, if um, it depends how much time you have. It depends if you're face to face. Let's say it's a um, eight week course with some kind of computer, not novices, but you know, not real tech savvy geek heads. Are they in the room with me or not? They're not. I would definitely not use the internet. Um, there's no way. Uh, oh. you, you see, I can't. There may He's be people ripening. out there who He's can maturing. do it that way. So What's what that? that? Say again. So they're but they're not together. They're they're geographically separated. And you would not use the internet? He means he means not use the internet in terms of not let them go out and find their own tool and use whatever oh, they want. I gotcha. Okay. You would put, not try if, to put them in the same thing. Into something that they can hold on together right. to. Because doing an open like doing a, an open course in the sense of massive open course where uh. people don't pay and everybody just kind of gets in there, you need to because it doesn't make – it's not about making sure that everybody goes through it. If you have a group of people who have paid – to be taught something like if, if particularly if it's a set of skills they're looking for they definitely need a place to touch down to because if they don't understand if they don't have the network's learning literacies and if they don't care and that's the big thing it's not even the network literacies that if you get give me 15 people who really want to learn something you know give me a couple of broken sticks in a sandbox and i'll teach them the thing is when people pay to learn something it's usually often sometimes because they're not 100% invested. They're like 64% invested. And when they're in that range, you need to be able to bring them together. You need their encouragement. You need to, you need to give them a place to go. You need to give them rhythms to fall into, or they'll just sort of wash off the side And of it. for that, your preferred platform would be? Uh, it depends. Mine the, um, the wiki. Really? It's a home A wiki still? Yeah, because people, you, I could teach Tom in three seconds how to edit a wiki. I can't for eight weeks. Teach him, no, I, I, I. Well, I'm with but, you that you need you need a quote home but, base, and so for me, I, I don't know. There, people are can handle them. I don't know for eight weeks. I don't know why. Um. Well, as a home base. Three days. Like I took, oh no, I mm. took well, David. Um. David Wiley's class, the first one I ever took was... Um, oh, yeah, with 47 other EdTech superstars along with you. Well, no, 
Oh, yeah, they did I mean, a great job. Bad. So is your argument that wikis bad. are too difficult for the long term or too simple? You need What's to your... understand a wiki really, really well to keep it running oh, for I the don't... long term. I yep. long term. Love that. Yep. You know, eight week class is not that long. I was in I was in a group of eighty people in the UK who were actually all ed tech professionals, and there's no way we could keep the wiki going. It just people went all over the place. The categories got crazy, and you couldn't follow anything anymore. It was crazy. Hey, let's do a I, wiki I barnstorming you... or barn raising. That'll be no, fun. No, I agree. Oh, yeah, I agree. You can't really you easy. can't do a discussion. Yeah, They're not. Con it depends on what you want. I thought you meant like where do you want to like have your home base or like facilitate it. And that yeah, is what I, I meant. Yeah. And I think it's a that fine is. answer. And I think all the pukey noises are unwarranted. <laughs> Not that I would choose a Thank wiki, but much. I think it's a Thank very you. valid well, argument. What I'm saying is, I, I, what I'm saying is, don't go. I, I would not go the LMS route. I just wouldn't because I think they're horrid. I just hate them, I would. and I think they're terrible. I would go the they're, LMS route. I would not which go which it LMS, provides, John? It it provides the structure, Be, and they really, you know, if they're not into the MOOC thing, you know, if they're not into open learning, if this is something that's new for them then the structure is what they need. Which and LMS? I would use Moodle. I would use Moodle. Moodle. Um, it allows you to make sure that they understand what is expected of them, um, and they can participate with one another. You can close the whole thing off. One of the things that's very intimidating for uh, people participating in, in an online course is the idea that everything they say is public. Um, so when you're, you're using something like blogs or you're in a MOOC or something, that can be very uh, off-putting to a lot of people because they they see that as a place to put their polished work, but not their work in progress. So I'd put them in a. In All a, right. One vote for Moodle. Wiki. One vote for Moodle. Mr. Andy, Cormier, what's your vote? Hmm. Really. Oh, sure. It's easy to make John. puking noises to other people's choices. No, no, but... I'm going to agree with John. Um, I, I, oh it's a, it's man, a, come on! It's a choice. It's the choice I've made over and over and over again. It's the same reason, the same problem. I I got not quite my gun a gun to my head, but uh, close to it the other day when somebody asked me about online facilitation platforms, and I ended up saying, "Look, it's Illuminate." Uh, I hate saying it out loud. I hate using the words, but the simple fact is, is that that software never breaks, and the breaking part that's the really bad part, and the confusion. Moodle, uh, brutal. I hate teaching with it. But every time I come up with a project idea and something crazy that we're doing or something weird we're trying to pull together and I'm bringing in people who don't know what they're doing, when they get to a Moodle page, they can find the first discussion forum. From there, we may never use the thing again. But just as the home base, I, I don't know anything else that allows them. It interfaces well with institutional systems. It, it looks familiar, it looks clunky and all those other things that are terrible about it. But, and it, you know, just the structure of it and the linearity of it, it's completely against all the stuff that I like, but man, does it work. And that's hard to, it's hard to beat. Hmm. I hate Illuminate, I hate suggesting it. I hate that company. There I said it. And Jeff, what would you do? Personally, since uh, my zone of comfort is Drupal, I would probably use a Drupal as the Which home base. Which is an LMS. I mean, that's a, it's a content manager. I mean, it, no. yeah, it can be structured it's... as an LMS, and I have them have their own blogs that could be set as private and could be brought into the Drupal or not. Yep. Mm -hmm. You know what? I built out the Drupals. My problem with them is that. Um, I don't like having to get rid of, I, I find them really hard to get rid of um, because they're not institutional and they just, the problem with being the place where you host the open stuff is that when you take it down, all the links break. Whereas if the Moodle is by its nature closed, when you remove it from the ecosystem, it doesn't break the existing links. So I have a website that I've been keeping going for about four years now just because my students kept linking back to stuff there and their blog posts won't make sense anymore if I remove that Drupal site. Whereas nobody would ever do that back to Moodle. Do you know what I mean? See, what's absolutely you wouldn't link back to it me. because what's... it's 
Something's it's killing Jen. What's killing in. you, Jen? It's killing me. I mean, we've spent <laughs> hundred and how many thousand shows already? Jen? What number are we on, Jen? Seven hundred and ninety tonight, something like that. Yeah. Talking about we have to have we have to encourage students from the get go to take ownership and create their own space and blue blue blue. And then we're saying, but we're going to create their own space and they have to use it. No, no, and no, I understand no, 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 you're, you're saying it. It's because no, 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 no. I don't no, no, think no. I am. I Let's said hear it. I said that I want to have Moodle. So that when I remove it from the ecosystem that you're building in the class, it doesn't break. Because if so you're, you're hosting, you're using your Moodle as a temporary home base, but then going to encourage them to, to place be to able find to... the syllabus. What else place is in your ecosystem? That's what my wiki Dave. is. But that's what my wiki is. It's home base. And the other it's thing not... is, why do you take it down? You said, oh, when I take it down, shouldn't it be designed to not be taken down? Not if I'm hosting it on my server. Some, well, I mean. When you look at Drupal, how often are you going to update that? Okay, let's say that you teach five courses a year, yeah. and each one of them get, and then you have to update it all the time, and then you have to go through the, and then the date module breaks as it always does, and then you're trying to make sure that it keeps working so that all those things keep running through it. That doesn't happen with Moodle. It's the same thing as WordPress. It doesn't break. Drupal breaks all the time. Every time you upgrade it, it breaks. And then you've I, got I, one for every course you've ever taught. And then you've got one for every course you've ever taught. You or can run them all off the same Drupal. Oh, I, maybe you can. I can. <laughs> and, and as Peggy mentioned, I mean, this is a Jeff solution. Drupal is not the kind of thing that anyone can, can choose for. But you know what? I think you could I've use a, a blog people. just as easily. Not just as easily, but I think a WordPress or a blog spot could be used right. as a and, teacher's and when I said home wiki, base. Yeah. I, sure. I don't mean like it has to be a wiki. I meant like a page, <laughs> like a page that's easily editable. Start here, people, and then we're going to branch out from here. But if you get confused, come back to this one page. Yeah. The problem I have with LMS is stuff mm -hmm. gets buried, and then some. I didn't find that. Where was that stored? I didn't see that. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. The part no, I it. agree with you, and I think that's I think that's a really bad usage. To me, I, I agree with, again, with John. Um <sighs> In that, I know, I know. In that, I like to have the one discussion forum that they can go log into and go, are you guys crazy? Just just the one place where you have that, that's for, for, the, for the group that Jeff described, right? For that kind of, meh, never really done it before, you know, to give them that chance to start out. By week three, they'd better be writing in their blogs or they won't pass my course if I'm forced to grade them. Um, I'm not saying that other stuff doesn't happen. But I like to have one place where they can go at any time and log in and know that that's a place where they can find out the fact that they've, you know, they can go in and go, look, I haven't been here for two weeks. What am I? What? Just right. that. So we probably are all yeah. saying the same thing. We're no, saying we're the whole same. home Except base. Except for that crazy Drupal guy. Sure. Because <laughs> <laughs> we who really thought, need to wrap thought... because everybody stopped listening half an hour ago. <laughs> well, and Jen stopped moving the about 20 time. minutes ago. You know what? I, all I see for Jeff is a round circle can, thing. Can you Jeff pause can... your or stop your video and then restart it? Because you've been know. smiling without moving for about 20 minutes. How about now? Oh, that's nice. You're coming back. Yeah, my but audio gets so much better. I, I cut out and got Jeff to call me back, and my whole situation changed. I had to cut out. I wonder if it's the way that the new Skype works. Uh, which you guys should... are starting to get verbally again right now. We should do a quick assessment of this. Just do an endpoint. And but first, I just want to say, what do you think of Skype multicam? Um, well, other than the fact you've been I, spinning for 20 minutes for me and Dave's been frozen for 20. I can't I can't believe how much John actually moves. <laughs> I, I expected this little this robot. Man I move constantly. Here. He's like waving his arms around. He's doing this stuff. And, you know, well, at least he, he doesn't get up and leave a seat gonna... in the middle of a discussion. That's true. I, had, I showed you my wine glass was empty. <laughs> What am I supposed wine to do glass. with an empty wine glass? It was broken. Wine glass? That looks like a coffee mug. No. Oh, oh it's a goblet. It's a chalice. A chalice. Yeah, it's from Korea. Chalice. Okay, so <laughs> Here was the official fermented beverage. All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining <laughs> us. <laughs> Some of us will be back <laughs> next week. Jennifer's going to edit this down so it makes more sense when you listen to it as a podcast. <laughs> no, have a good week, time. everybody. Cheers. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Now, do we still do post shows? We no. haven't done a post show since you left. Not a one. I hate to tell you. No. <laughs>
You like you're, you're done and then you tell. go. Well, the chat room's already empty. They're already <laughs> they're already leaving. They know. Man. Dave Dave hangs up on everybody right after the show. <laughs> Man, cold. Things have gone so cold. cold it's true. It's true. I think it's, it's funny that the bad. most controversial question was like, what platform would you use? To... <laughs> no, you're stupid. <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's funny. Yeah, it does. And the truth is, is it doesn't matter. Um, no. But if you force me, the, the Illuminate thing really hurts. I had to say that to somebody last week, and it really, really burned. But they said, look, if you need, like, I can't advise anything else. Yeah. You know, how many times have I seen uh, like a breeze just freaking fall apart? Um, you know, there's none of this, this sort of open store stuff that actually, I mean, you can do this, but what am I going to do? Teach them how to do their virtual audio cables? Um, <laughs> yeah. Not so much. Wood IQ is hanging in there. Dim Dim sold out. I never out. used that one. Yeah, Dim Dim, Dim, Dim Yeah, well, we have a, we have a yeah. Dim Dim account. We have an enterprise Dim Dim account. And did you get kind of a nasty, even though your grandfather didn't, we really don't like you anymore type of yeah, email? Did. Yeah, we did. We sure did. Yeah. That's funny. Okay, send us our money back, and then we cannot like you either. And... <laughs> no. But yeah. Not even that. Me... Jen, I missed your video. Let me, just for the sake of troubleshooting, just hang, hang up, up on, on you her. and okay. call you right back. Could you guys see me before I hung up? Because I was spinning for me. I think we saw it. Yeah, we saw you. Yeah, you I were spinning you initially. You were spinning when you were trying to share your desktop. Mm -hmm. I was trying mm -hmm. to share my desktop. No, no Dave, Dave was still Dave spinning. Look oh, at you. Dave was. Yeah, you guys are spinning for me too. Mm -hmm. I think I have that bandwidth issue. You guys it must be you and your North American bandwidth. I'm sure it's Comcast. Likely. I'm sure I've gone over some cap of some sort, and they're not happy with me. You guys have usage space pulling there? Poor Sheila. No. We were experimenting with this on the brainstorm Thursday, and uh, Sheila was game as always, and had to uninstall her Skype, and then discovered she didn't have the right Mac uh, OS version for this, so screwed up her mm. computer once again for old times' sake. Ta-da! Um, oh, look at that. It could be because she's a Wisconsin fan. Hey, that's not nice. Ohio person there. What was the score Don't again? Don't make fun of Ohio people. Don't make fun of Ohio people. I can't believe the what Cavs won. Okay. Who'd they Yay. beat? Cavs. Washington know. Generals? Who cares? So, yeah, Jeff, what do you think Generals. of, um, <laughs> what do you think of the new format? I, I like understood, it. Dave. You like it? Yeah. He doesn't like it. You, you can tell. Yeah. yeah <laughs> he misses like the old it. format. Say that. Yeah, as I long, like it. I love no, it. No, as long as I, I can like it. come up with the link and preface it for a minute and then let you guys and go. And then toss it back. Me. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> um, and are we all back next week? Um. Jeff, huh? I'm not. Mm -hmm. I'm not. Oh, John, you're not? Jeff's Where back. No, I'm here, oh. but we have uh, oh. friends coming in from out of town. We're going oh. snow tubing on Sunday night, I think. You'll have snow? We won't have snow by then. Do we have a guest yeah, host have... next snow. week? Uh, wasn't check the uh, Christian still? Wasn't Christian on the check list? Check the wiki. Check Which the wiki. is pretty cool because he's GMT. It still kind of breaks my heart that we have to use a wiki instead of the EdTech Talk Drupal for the show planning. It's because Dave set up a wiki. He, the he's a wiki fanboy. That's do it. where his pukey noises come from. Yeah. He doesn't want to. He likes Illuminate. He likes wikis. Probably likes. I would Blackboard. have used a Google Doc. <laughs> I love, he probably likes Blackboard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he loves Blackboard and Illuminate. They're his favorite. Oh, um, that's right. The, well, in fact, um, we're switching uh, EdTech Talk to to Illuminate, aren't we? I don't know if I'll be here the 27th. Are we bringing Hargadon on? I'll be in BAM. <laughs> and oh, okay. uh, I don't know. I may. I don't know what connectivity I'm going to have Was, there. Or, is or Jeff be, around yeah. on the 27th? I believe so. Okay. Because, you know, we can't have a show without one of you. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, we were so promising back in the Suds cast days. Back in the day. Yeah. All right. Yeah, we did. We gonna switch to Ice Cast soon? Uh, as yeah, soon as you second. install it, yeah. I did oh, before. I have, I have to mention, EdTech Talk has not gone down in five or six days. That's a good thing. Thanks for doing that, that Jeff. I was I, All I kept thinking was, oh my god, when am I going to do that? I've gotten pretty good at moving servers. I bet you have. Is it about 20 now? This is server number 13. Yeah, um, that's only since you started counting. Yeah. There were yeah. a bunch before that. That's true. Um... Yeah, and we're maybe. back on a C panel, a uh, control panel. No, I don't see you, Jen. Oh, so if we wanted to move, saying. it would be a one-click thing. Hmm. That's weird. I wonder if we should make address that file system someday. Not today. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go eat should we hang up while John's gone? Everybody and they'll come back. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Where did my Hello. friends go? Hello. Um, oh, I can turn off the uh, recorder. Cheers, Gary. All righty, turn off. Has oh. Gary been a guest host? Yeah, Gary's been in. Um, but I don't know if he's a been a guest host, host, but he's been in. Yeah, why is he been a guest awesome, host? He's awesome, actually. Yeah, he certainly has. He knows how to use a wiki. I'm not sure why he hasn't. <laughs> Exactly. We have a lot of blank spots, don't we? Yeah, Gary just doesn't. He's yeah, he's grumpy. Those guys in the West, out the, those Albertans, they're all that way. Grumpy. Um. Alrighty. Well, I'm gonna go eat my. Well, yeah, Gary still needs to edit something from a webcastathon three years ago. I'm still waiting for that, <laughs> Gary. <laughs> <laughs> so, Je um, Dave, can we call 182 we a lost episode? Yeah, my Audacity copy of it just blew up before I started this webcast. I actually tried to recover it, and I've been beating it. But th it's possible that um, Graham, uh, pardon me, Grant Potter has a copy because we co-webcasted that with DS106. Mm -hmm. um, it was really cool, actually. It was me and Grant and Jim Groom, and we were broadcasting off of both um, servers at the same time. It was really fun. Uh, and they're, they're so great anyway. Yeah, it was really cool. It was a great chat. Yeah, this um, DS-106 thing is rocking, eh? Yeah, it sure is. I, I Actually, it's funny, Jeff, because in the midst of that conversation, I had the... In 1998, I remember talking to Jeff Lebo, and he said... <laughs> and it was like, everything they were saying, I was like, okay, 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 okay. I've got a recording of this somewhere. You guys can just stop talking. I can just play the recording. Because <laughs> I've heard this before. <laughs> we're sitting in his back deck. It was He was having one of his thinking days. And, uh, yeah. Jeff was having a thinking day? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what was I thinking about? I don't know. Are we still webcasting? Still yes. broadcasting? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, What's your, what did you say, Jeff, uh, that everybody uh, would have so what their did we decide about radio cast? station or something like that? What did you say? That was in the Horizon report. <laughs> Where is that? It is in the Horizon report. <laughs> uh, hang on, let me find it. Everyone was going to have their own global radio show next month. It was my vision in 1998. No, it was. And John and I still don't stream. Personal broadcasting uh, in the 2006 Horizon Report was in the one to two year range. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now you it's know, just omitted. Completely. I just have to mention, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. out of love with Ustream. I do not like their pre-roll ads. Oh yeah, that's brutal. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, could we have a flash-based just player on the live page? That's hard. That just uh, you know, like you running Red Five or something. Uh, I don't know. I mean, we wouldn't need video. I mean, I know you love video, but we don't really need it. That just so instead of having these three icons, that depending on you know how the stars have aligned when you set up your computer, one of them works, maybe. Can we just have a little player in there that just played the audio? Using like from Shoutcast or Icecast? Whatever, using something. Yeah, using some streaming server that just Yeah, plays we looked into page. that, hadn't we, Dave? And like the well, problem- I think I actually had it working. Yeah, I think the problem is 
that somehow it uses up memory. And like the longer it's on, the more memory it consumes. And I believe that was some kind of technical hurdle so at that point. So it crashes the server once a week? That yeah, sound no, so no like every five <laughs> minutes of the show. <laughs> yeah. Here, guys, this is why I was waving. One of the reasons I was waving my arms in the middle of the show. Aww. 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 These are fresh. I love 94, 98. These are very fresh. Yeah, and, that's pretty um, much how many pants on. Kids, he doesn't have any pants on. And then you get to so, look at the cute kids. So why was she doing that? So the, She's the been delay doing a series of blog chill. posts about me. Oh, Ooh, those, um, I've seen it's, some of it's those. So and that's cute. part of this? Yeah. It's yeah. it's mo every Monday, right? Yeah. yeah. It's the home the project. Home project. Yeah, Look at so, that microphone. How funny is that? I love this microphone. Are you kidding? I can't believe you don't have a pop filter on that. Gosh. What mic is that? Sennheiser. It's morning drive time mic. Yeti. Yeti. It's blue. It's from the blue company. Uh -huh. The same guys who made the snowball. Mm -hmm. It's listen the the echo control control on this is breathtaking. I put it in the front of the classroom. It's got four um, different mic settings in the back. And if you put it on the sort of all around setting on it, put it in the front of the microphone in the front of the classroom. Put it right by the speakers. Students can still talk through Skype to the front of the classroom to somebody. Up, oh, crazy! I, I, the first time I tried it, I was like, "There's no way this is gonna work," and I asked. It was, uh, I think it was Dave White or Alan Levine. One of those guys was talking, skyping in my classroom, and they're like, "How are you doing that anyway?" And I'm sorry, use that to pick up sound from the whole classroom, or did they have to come and like speak right into the mic? Whole classroom, back of the class, nice. hollering out so, questions. How much did that cost? 200 250 something like that for, i mean for somebody who's who's bought 15 microphones <laughs> mm -hmm. you know the only problem with it is the industrial design on this has one big flaw and that's when you pull that you see the cable yes i see do. where it hits it hits right there and if you pull too hard this way it'll snap the usb mount right off And a four-year-old in your house? Say, for example. Yeah, say, for example. Uh, I had to send the first one back, and I was like, look, it's there's the mount's broken off of this. It was the first day I had it. Now, when I'm done with it, I pull the cables out of the bottom, which on my Mac is great because when I pull the cables out, it reverts back to just the, the standard mic and webcam. And then when I plug them back in, it automatically comes back to the to the microphone. So, Amazon and has it also for hundred bucks. Kids. For a hundred? Yep. Yeah. Ninety nine ninety nine. Microphone plus I love free it. super saver shipping. Yeah, I have. Uh, well, I mean, you guys would know better what the sound is like, but um, I absolutely Sounds awesome. love it. Morning, morning drive time. Morning is this your original it's drive not, time mic? It's not as no. good as Jeff, but no, it's, it's not. pretty good. Yeah, that's because Jeff's voice is awesome, though. Yeah, that's true. Um, we should have software that fixes that for the rest of us. No, yeah, no kidding. Actually, nothing like Scott Lockman, though. Man, he was on again the other day. Every time I hear his voice, I just go, ooh, what a voice. <laughs> Man, he has the wickedest radio voice I've ever heard. Yes, he does. He sure does. And I'm now for... The, uh, well, this will be posted shortly, by the way. <laughs> As we're talking, it's almost, it's almost awesome. done. How do you get all those edits done so fast? I've got a special um, a de-ummer software. It's really, it's really good. It doesn't even record them anymore. It, does, it just doesn't record them. Keep talking. <laughs> Don't let me bother you as I'm editing. So Oscar size first T-Rex this weekend. Jen, thank Sue. you for lending us your T-Rex. That's an awesome T-Rex. Say again? Thank you for Sue. lending us your T-Rex. So how, how did he see that? You mean like Chicago's T-Rex is in Halifax. Oh, oh it it's is? A, it, oh, I did not know. Yeah. 
You didn't yeah. notice it I was thought, gone? I didn't <laughs> notice it was gone. <laughs> <laughs> I thought maybe it was like a, an online presentation or something. No. In, in, he saw it I live. Like it. I got to say, he was a bit nonplussed. Eh, it's not that big. Really? Eh. <laughs> it's, it's pretty big. Eh. It's got a, you know, the impressive part is the head. Like how enormous. It is. Like it is. the head's the size of a Volkswagen. I guess it's big. No, it's not. No. It's it's large. No, and that's exactly it. He'd been told it was the size of a Volkswagen. He went, meh, I guess it's big. Closer to that. Was his that? Golf that's cart. Sue. That's Sue, yeah. Sue. That's yours. Belongs to you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we took it. By soldier, uh-huh. by soldier Field. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a big dinosaur. Mm-hmm. That was fun. Okay, well, I, I'm going to go eat chili now. Good idea. We'll it's lovely chatting with you fine folks. It this certainly was. Awesome. was. A long time. Uh-huh. Long time mm-hmm. in the making. Okay, ta-ta. So, um, Sorry, John. Do... We'll see you next week. Yeah, yeah, it'll be fine. You guys yeah. will do it'll a great job, fine. I'm sure. It'll be fine. Um, um, I'll add the ums. Um, um, <laughs> okay, good. Ta-ta for now. Good. Bye. Have a great Bye, week. Jen. Thanks, everybody. Bye, guys.